Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. I have a really interesting guest today, Richard Firth Godby here. Yes, that's his name, and he's got an interesting story about the origins of that name, Firth Godby here. Anyway, Richard is one of the world's leading experts on disgust and emotions. He is an independent researcher and consultant in the history, language, science, and philosophy of emotions, which is what his new book is about. It's called A Human History of Emotion, How the Way We Feel Built the World We Know. He is also an honorary research fellow at the Center for the History of the Emotions, Queen Mary University of London. He received a first-class degree from the University of London, during which time he won two awards for academic excellence, alongside a master's degree from the University of Cambridge and a PhD from Queen Mary University of London, where he was a Wellcome Trust scholar. The Wellcome Trust is a well-known history of science, technology, and medicine. Center. His award winning interdisciplinary research walks the line between history, psychology, linguistics, and futurism. He examines how understandings of emotions change over time and how these changes can influence the wider world. So, we get into talking about what are emotions exactly, how are they defined, how, how are they different from, say, feelings or desires, say, the difference between lust and love, uh, as an example. Um, how the understanding of the emotions has changed historically and culturally. People felt differently in the past than we do today. The nature and nurture of emotions, which is more powerful, biology or culture? And it, the answer is both are important, and we look at how they interact. We talk about Paul Ekman's research on universal uh, emotional traits and how some of that has failed to replicate uh, or it was uh, lacking in certain controls that when examined in a different light shows that culture plays a much more powerful role than Ekman and his colleagues thought. This was in the 80s and 90s. And, um, and then we look at the different emotions, specifically love, hate, anger, fear, disgust, pleasure, pain, hunger, thirst, lust, attraction, desires, passions, and more, happiness, so forth. Uh, we talk about Lisa Feldman Barrett's current research in which she challenges the uh, Ekman paradigm of universal human emotions. Uh, and then we look at some of the past, the ancient Greeks and, and Romans, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, how things changed about the nature of sin and sinful behaviors and emotions, the witch crazes of the early modern period, and to what extent people uh, felt about that. That is, what were these people thinking as they're torching these women, or in England where they hung them? Why hanging versus uh, burning? And, and we talk about, he talks about, gives an explanation for that. We look at uh, the Schachter Singer theory of emotions uh, and some of the competitors. And the, the, the um, terms of the debate are that to what extent do you have quick bodily changes in response to some threat, let's say a snake on a pathway. And then after those bodily changes happen, including stress hormones pumping through your uh, blood and then registers in the brain somewhere higher cortical area and you then feel fear or does the feeling of fear upon seeing the snake happen first and then the bodily changes happen in response or both anyway so uh, that's the, kind of the the nature of the debate as as it stands and there's a long history to it and this is a fascinating conversation about all of that so I hope you enjoy that and if you appreciate the podcast do give us some support Go to skeptic.com slash donate. Your donations to the Skeptic Society, it's a 501c3, so they are tax deductible. And that supports the podcast along with all our other activities like Skeptic Magazine and our media outreach program. All right, thanks for listening. And here is this discussion on emotion. Before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Wondrium. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-N, Wondrium. This is the former Great Courses, the teaching company that has expanded uh, its horizons to include documentary series and other learning content produced by uh, adjacent companies. And it's a subscription service. So you sign up and you get access to all these great courses that you used to have to buy individually back in the, in the dark ages when I first started uh, with the teaching company. 
Uh, I used to actually have to purchase the course and they would mail them to you in boxes of cassette tapes. That's how far back I go. Now, of course, everything is digital. You can just access it on your phone or on your uh, laptop. I use it on my phone so I can uh, listen to courses at 1.2 or 1.3 speed and while I'm driving or cycling or hiking or walking or doing chores or just about anything. And I can get through a course a week easily. So here's the uh, program. It's that if you go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get a 22, 22 day free trial. So it doesn't cost anything. You can give it a try. You can scan around and try different lectures, different courses. Like here's one I'm going to listen to uh, this week. It's called Dark Matter, Dark Energy, The Dark Side of the Universe. Okay, it's 24 lectures. Each of them is about a half an hour long, so about 20 minutes if you listen to it at slightly higher speed. And it includes things like the primordial nuclear synthesis, the cosmic microwave background, dark stars and black holes, strings and extra dimensions. Was Einstein right? Uh, quintessence, future experiments, the past and future of the dark side of the universe. So again, if you subscribe at wondrium.com slash Shermer, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash S-H-E-R-M-E-R, you get a 22-day free trial. Give it a shot. You got nothing to lose. It's great content, and I highly endorse it. And there are supporters of our podcast here. So we really appreciate that. Now, here's our guest. So, um, your book, the history of a, the human history of emotions. I listened to the audio version. I don't have a print version yet. No. Mail's a little slow these days, but it's okay. I I got the gist of it, and uh, you know, <laughs> I I know a fair amount about this subject, but I, I I really didn't know there was a history. There was a study of the history of emotions, which is you know yeah. your main thing here, and that's what your book is about. And I learned so much. I just stuff stuff I kind of thought I knew, or maybe I'd kind of vaguely. Uh, <laughs> was aware of. And then when you put it all together, it's like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. There's a scholarly study of the history of emotions. <laughs> so let's just start yep. there. How did you get into this? Give us a little bit of background about your your own self, where you were born and raised and went to school and how you got into this particular <laughs> subject. And also, by the way, there has to be an interesting story behind your name, Firth, God be here. Okay. So give us mm. the whole story. <laughs> well, let's go back to the beginning. Um, According yes, to my auntie, yeah. and I will never doubt my auntie, uh, I never dare, <laughs> um, she traced our surname, Godby here, back to the Vikings. Um, and it is basically Godbert, which is God's light, which basically is the name of the priesthood in the Vikings, and beer, which funnily enough means beer. Um, so it looks like my ancestors were Viking ale gods, which whether it's true or not, I'm going to hold on to that because I really like it. Um but that's the origin as far as she can tell. Um, funny. I love that. I wish I had that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And everybody said, are you religious? No. Which is the uh, <laughs> shocking thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so that's at the beginning. I was born in Sheffield uh, in Yorkshire in the UK. Um, I spent most of my young life dreaming of being a rock star. That, as you can tell, turned out really well. And so... <laughs> One day, because I'd always been interested in history, it was always my hobby. I had this great idea of swapping my job for my hobby and my hobby for my job. And so I did a history degree, got to university and thought, I like it here. I think I'm going to stay and have <laughs> ever since then at various levels. Part way while I was doing my, probably my dissertation, actually, for my undergraduate degree, uh, my wife, as she now is, um, suffers from a phobia called a metaphobia, which is a fear of vomiting and sickness. And I wanted to understand it, but um, I do history. So um, so I started getting into that side of things, and I discovered that people study these sorts of things in history, feelings and emotions and that sort of area. Um, and for me, uh, nobody had really had a good look at the his history of disgust and how people used to find things disgusting, what disgust was. Uh, and when you're shopping around for a PhD topic and you see a massive open window like that, you go, oh, that could be for me. So I started studying disgust, both the psychology of it, the philosophy of it, everything about disgust. And with that came emotions in general, because I've, it's part of that network. Um, and that's what I did my PhD thesis on, um, a, a version of old versions of disgust, which are known as abomination and all sorts of other things, um, and started working as a 
is story of emotions. And then one day after writing an article telling the AI community that we're getting emotions wrong, um, somebody contacted me and said, would you like to write a book? <laughs> I said, yeah, I could write a book. So that's why I got to know. <laughs> that's an incredible story. Yeah, well, there's much to unpack there. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to the AI and, and, and can data yeah. on Star Trek ever have true emotions? Because uh, <laughs> yes. that's, that's the last chapter in your book. That's super fascinating because that is a problem for the AI people. I mean, the idea of like the robots, the robo apocalypse, they're going to take over the world as if the robots have emotions and they want to conquer people or control people like they want something. Well, that's like a wanting is kind of an emotion, right? So yeah, uh, how would how would we ever even program that? And how would we even know if they have that? But but let's use uh, disgust as, as your en en entry into this problem, because that's something you've studied a lot and the nature nurture issue. So. Disgust mm -hmm. appears to be an evolved emotion, but what you are disgusted about appears to be a cultural phenomenon, right? So if somebody offers yeah. me a plate of grilled cockroaches, I'm going to, like your wife, you know, barf or throw up or like, uh, and yet somebody in another culture would just dive right in and like, these are delicious. So that would be an example. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are so many things. It appears at the basic level, disgust is a way of protecting us from pathogens. That's what it is. You see something that might make you ill and you don't eat it. And the humans that did eat it died. So that's what, you know, classic evolution. Um, but, you know, um, the Scandinavians eat things that it has to have been buried for a few years and fermented nicely. Most of us wouldn't eat that stuff. Um, then you've got a third of the world's populations eating insects, including me sometimes. Mealworms are really nice, by the way. Um, a little bit of salt, a bit like somewhere between a pork scratching and the popcorn. Very nice. Um, and uh, yeah, but lots of people go, oh, mealworms. Ugh. And it's what, how we, what we are told to evolve, what we are told to be disgusted by, if you like, what we learn to be disgusted by. It's a very cultural thing. And most emotions follow that pattern, that there is something evolved, some quite simple stimulus response thing that helps us evolve, helps us survive. But there's this huge package of things that cultures, that humans have put on it to make them much more complicated than just, Ugh, horrid, get away. Um, and we develop things like acquired tastes and morals and all sorts of things off the back of them. Um, so something like vomit, feces, open pussy wounds on flesh, that, that, that's kind of, a universal disgust, like bleh. and because it you has think... pathogens in it, and and it's better we don't do that. Yes, but there are Is it tribes that have been found. There are tribes that have been found. I won't name names, but there are tribes that have been found out there who, one of the things they would do after conquering the next door neighbors is roast their intestines, feces and all, and eat them as a delicacy. Mm. So even there, okay. If you can think mm. of it, someone somewhere eats it, no matter how vile it is. So <laughs> yeah, that's okay. a weird thing. All right. It. So yeah, <laughs> I'm always fascinated by human universals. You know, Don Brown's, mm. Dan Brown's, Don Brown's book on human universals. He had hundreds in there, but it seems like yeah. you can always find an exception. So maybe we just need fuzzy mm. sets. Like most people, most of the time in most places find this disgusting and maybe that's, that's okay. Yeah, there is a there's a sort of a language group, a, a, a game, if you like, that we all play within emotions, within disgust, since that's where we are. Where there are, there is a uh, in there, whatever noise you want to make, you know, be by full from in the early modern, all this kind of stuff. Um, but definitely, there's um, interpretation of those universals that goes on. And that's kind of my position with emotions. There is a big war within emotion research about this right now, but. I like to sit in the middle and go, hey, you're both wrong and right. So calm down. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So you're saying that in, in addition to culture modifying these emotions, these innate mm -hmm. emotions, how we even discuss how cultures modify those emotions are the, is themselves another area of what is just, I guess, tweaking the concept of emotions, yeah. whichever specific emotions there were. So you have two factors, three, you have the, the, the nature of it, the nurture of it, and then how we even talk about it or analyze it 
what language yeah. we use. Yeah, the, la the language we use makes a big, big difference. Um, an example that's in the book is um, how this thing, abomination, which is like a religious form of revulsion, sort of a revulsion for sin. Back in the Hebrew Bible, there's a good half a dozen different words to describe very subtle, different kinds of disgust. And then along came uh, the Vulgate authors, and they said, no, we're just going to use one word, abominatio. There you go. It's one thing now. And all of a sudden, this complicated thing became simple. Um, it happens all the time. There's language in different languages and different people. Yeah. It's, so um, how, do, how does culture affect emotions? For example, no one ever sat me down when I was growing up and said, we don't eat cockroaches, and it's gross and disgusting, and then I inculcate that into my thinking. Uh, is it just that I've never seen it on TV and Western culture and... I just don't experience it. And so how did it become disgusting for me? How does that work? It's, there's a lot goes on when you're very, very young. Um, they don't sit you down and say, don't eat that. But the number of things, uh, you've seen what babies try and put in their mouths, I'm sure. And how parents react and go, no, don't put that in there. That's dirty. You know, there you go. That's where it begins. Um, and it's sort of very early. Very, I mean, disgust is a weird one because that one we've shown that some children as late as eight can't differentiate between fear faces and disgust faces. So that one takes a bit of time, a bit of repetition compared to some of the others. Um, making somebody happy, a smile, being happy, that's very quickly because as soon as a baby smiles, it gets fawned over, it gets, so the baby goes, oh, this is good, I'll do that again next time I feel like this. So it's, you know, um, much quicker. But yeah, it's... Um, it's like anything else in your development in, in the early years, your culture and your parents and all sorts of other things feed into you things you don't even realize are there, are happening, and that makes you you um, eventually. Yeah. Right. So let's go back to the beginning where you start your book with the ancient mm -hmm. Greeks and Romes, Romans, and right. we can also talk about the Hebrews and the Old Testament, New Testament, and all, all that. Yeah. How did they think about emotions? What words did they use? You gave that one example uh, of simplifying the word disgust, whatever that word was. Uh, and, <laughs> and so kind of run us through a brief brief history, as it were, without giving away your whole book. <laughs> well, the Greeks in general, um, they agreed. They didn't agree often, but they agreed that they thought there were three parts to a soul. So there was a bit that was the stuff that makes life. Uh, plants have it, humans have it, animals have it. There was a bit that felt stuff and moved, the, the sensitive soul, they sometimes called that, and that was uh, the bit that felt, the bit that saw, the bit that hears, that sort of thing. Plants don't have that, humans and animals do. And then there was a the bit that thinks, the reasonable soul, the rational soul. Um, and this is what, when you read your Bible and you hear your flesh, body, spirit thing, and even the Trinity of God, some explanations say that's where that comes from that there is a, a reason bit a flesh bit and a feeling bit um, which one's which that's another discussion but that's what they that's one of the origins of that um the sensitive bit is supposed to be where you feel things and the sensitive bit can feel something uh it can be perturbed by the world around it's normally in balance something happens your sensitive soul feels a wobble in your heart they believed which is also where that comes from and um, it sends things out to the rest of your body. And that's a feeling. That's a pathé, which is a disturbance. Um, now, it can happen the other way around. You can think something and think, I should be angry about that, and then express your anger. And that's an affect, which is a, a more a higher form, if you like. And the higher forms are, lead you to true bliss. If you can get the higher forms of emotion and control them, Lots of different Greek philosophies out there, be it Platonic or Stoic, try and get you to have this controlled sort of feeling that will take you to true happiness, true desires, which is basically desire to not desire anything but goodness, virtue, in the case of the Greeks. Whereas the other feelings, they can lead you the other way. They'll get you worldly, you might get worldly goods, you might get rich, you might get whatever, but ultimately it won't be virtuous, so it won't be good, really. You'll always desire more. Um, and this is a theme that goes through a lot of ancient cultures, ancient India, the early, um, early Indian cultures. They also had uh, Hindus, uh, had this same idea that you should repress the sort of desire for things because it will lead you to a bad place. But if you keep the desire for 
like Nirvana in the case of the Buddhism or your Dharma in the case of Hindus, then it'll take you to a good place. Um, so the ancient world had a lot of this idea. It was very focused on desire and virtue. That's sort of the core of their emotional being, if you like. Desire and virtue is what you want. Um, Stoics called it eupathia. It's proper feelings as opposed to pathé, which is the bad ones. Um, and this also, you find it in Christianity, because you don't get Christianity without Greeks, really. Um, and so it, when you get to the, the idea that the, the idea is, is to live a better life, and yes. that's the goal? The goal is to live a virtuous life, and a virtuous life basically means to use a shortcut, um, selfless, a life for others, doing things for others, not doing things for yourself, for personal gain. Or in the case, if you're a Buddhist, it's to try and reach nirvana, to meditate, to not allow the world to impose upon you at all. In some forms of Buddhism, to think the world doesn't even exist. It's not really there. So you've got to try and ignore it and go inwards and find peace and nirvana. But it's all about, it's all sort of desire based. It's a desire to not desire the things that you desire which is kind of weird and <laughs> that's what they were doing um you mean because it may lead some, to a less virtuous yeah, life because it will lead to a less virtuous life because if uh, you want to become incredibly rich and incredibly powerful you generally have to do bad things so there's, there has to be a, a dip in your virtue somewhere um and so they didn't like that very much the greeks they said no it's all about virtue it's all about living a good life without any of that um, it doesn't matter about being rich and powerful. It matters about being virtuous. Um, anyone who knows anything about the history of Greece knows that that's not entirely successful, but that was the idea. So is Aristotle's virtue ethics all about training your emotions by acting virtuous, and then you'll feel virtuous, and then you'll set up a positive feedback loop, and that will lift all of society to be more virtuous? Yeah, that's basically virtue ethics in a nutshell. It's his, his famous phrase, you are what you do repeatedly. That if you keep on being virtuous, you'll feel good, and so you'll be more virtuous, so you'll feel good, so you'll be more virtuous, so you'll feel good. So virtue itself is kind of an, a, a path and a, a eupathia. In fact, in itself, you'll feel virtuous. You'll feel pleasant because of the virtue. Or even if you don't feel pleasant, because you don't necessarily have to feel good to be virtuous. You can do something that's bad but necessary to be virtuous um the stoics took that to an extreme that you know i am supposed to execute these people here because that's my what i do so the virtuous thing to do is execute all these people so it doesn't have to necessarily be a good thing it just has to be the thing that your reason if you like perceives as the correct thing to do in the circumstance um you mean, say, I have a disease, I don't want to go to the doctor, I hate uh, hospitals and so on, but I have to do this so that, you know, next year I don't yeah. have this disease anymore and I'm healthier. So that's what yeah. you're talking about. So the virtuous thing could seem like it's not virtuous, but we have to do this terrible thing to make society better in the long run. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, I can't think of any parallels at the moment, but um, yes, <laughs> there's, there's things we sometimes have to do to make things better for everybody and that's uh that's it in a nutshell that's the virtue ethics of aristotle and that the the eupathia the hunt for eupathia the idea is that ultimately you will feel really good about this when you see that the horrible thing you did did make things better you know um whereas if you just yeah, go for the good old times you avoid the doctors you go the wrong way so. yeah i just thought of a, a current example on abortion since that's in the news here in the states hmm possibility of Roe v. Wade being overturned. But if you're yeah. going to pull back and look at the differences between pro-life and pro-choicers, you know, the pro-life community, mostly conservative, religious conservatives, they feel the solution is discipline. Uh, just don't sleep around. Just be virtuous. Just uh, 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 and, and, and just wait till marriage and, and take a chastity pledge, which requires a lot of self-discipline. And pro-choicers yeah. tend to say that's not very realistic. You can say that now, but in the passion of the moment, uh, you know, and then something happens and you're not prepared. You don't have birth control and boom. So we yeah. end up with unwanted pregnancies. And so really the core behind it is this debate about virtue and to what extent you can control your passions yes. now versus at the, your future self in the moment, passion of the moment. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, the Stoics were very big on this virtue idea. Um, their most famous Stoic, Marcus Aurelius, the great emperor, the great Stoic emperor, wrote a book, wrote a diary, basically listing his failings or when he got it wrong. Because he was constantly getting it wrong. So he had to write down, oh, I must work at this. I must meditate on this. I must, because I'm constantly getting my stoics. So even the greatest of all time, um, would, you know, the most famous of all time, would say, yeah, it's hard. So maybe you would argue it's the right path, but I don't know. Yes. Well, here we're talking about um, the nature of the self. And mm. there is no permanent self. There's me right now. Then there's future me. And I know, for yeah. example, tomorrow um, uh, at 5.30 in the morning when I get up, I'm not going to want to put my workout clothes on and go for my bike ride with my buddies. So I'm going to set everything out ahead of time and have the water bottles yeah. for my bike in the car with the bike ready to go because I know future Shermer is going to be weak. And so the, the more yeah. current Shermer can set it up for the future Shermer to make it easier. And, you know, don't go shopping on, a, on an empty stomach because then you'll buy all the cookies and ice cream and, and, and crappy oh, foods yeah. and you know, and so forth. So really, we're talking about a, a, a kind of self-control here. And I've noticed in the mm. last maybe five years, there's been several books about Stoicism. Like, like yeah. let's revive this ancient philosophy because it's really good for the current world. <laughs> yeah, they have. I mean, um, CBT, uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, I know people that argue it's modern Stoicism. It's a very similar... You learn to reflect on your feelings and decide whether your feelings are what you should be using them or not, or whether you should just let them go. Well, that's stoicism. That really is. That's kind of what they do. Um, and it's, it does seem to be, uh, I think it, some people find it quite successful or power to them if that's their thing, you know? Um, and yeah, it's, um, I don't blame Star Trek. It's not Spock, but it could be. <laughs> Well, you don't want to be Spock. I mean, we have to have our emotions or we can't even make decisions, right? I mean, there's research on that. If people that have brain damage in the yeah. amygdala or wherever uh, and they can't make emotional decisions, they sit there in front of the wall of toothpaste and they don't know what to buy, right? Whereas Absolutely, you and I walk yeah. in and go, I like the blue one and that's it, done. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm off to the next uh, aisle. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's, there's plenty of um, research on the idea of, I mean, I hear it all the time that, oh, you, you, you must separate emotion from reason. I'm like, well, uh, you might want to read Thomas Hobbes and people like that. They'll explain to you why yeah. that's very difficult. Um, so. Well, and, and here I'll read. I had this quote queued up from my, uh, my personal hero, David Hume. Uh, reason <laughs> is and ought only to be the slave of the passions and can never pretend to any other office than to serve and obey them. So here you have the hmm. champion of all time of reason saying, well, reason's yeah. just the slave of the passion. Well, what's he telling us there? He's not telling us to, you know, party like it's 1999 and cut loose and do whatever you want. He's saying that yeah. reason can't tell us what goals we should aim for. Like, why should I fall in love? I, I don't need a reason for that. It, it just happens. I have a feeling. Yeah. Now, I, I can use reason to decide, you know, who I should marry or whatever, but, but it's the passions that drive us. That's what makes us most deeply human. So you don't want to be Spock in that sense. No. Well, um, I'm thinking of older Spock, but that's my nerd badge oh. showing the post emotion. <laughs> oh, Spock. that's Spock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll not quote Star Trek six. I'm not that big a nerd. <laughs> no. Um, okay. But yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, Hume's uh, really onto them. I mean, Hume's uh, also, uh, there's a quote about, you know, it, if you've got an itch, why not blow up the whole world? <laughs> it's just yeah, about, right. Right. The reason right. would say, well, I know I have to get rid of this. I'll destroy everything. But we don't right. because that would feel really quite bad. Um, yeah, Hume's a bit of a hero of mine as well. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's get into uh, the, the Roman world. I mean, which seemed rather mm. lascivious and, 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 uh, and passion driven with all their orgies. And maybe I'm just thinking of Caligula in that movie <laughs> that opens with this <laughs> orgasmic <laughs> Uh, scene, but you know, the Roman Colosseum and all this stuff, you know, how did their worldview change, you know, shift differently from the ancient Greeks in terms of virtue ethics and, and those kinds of uh, positive emotions? Well, funny enough, the Romans themselves didn't change much from the Greeks because they nicked most of their stuff from the Greeks anyway, but there were some, there were some thinkers around, um, that wrote about feelings in a very stoical way. Um, 
think plenty i think it's plenty the elder particularly wrote a lot of this is how we ought to control our emotions and look into ourselves um it, it, stoicism was a big deal in a lot of the history of the Roman Empire. It was sort of up there, um, duking out with Christianity for a while as being the philosophical mindset of the of the of the people. Um, it's kind of it lost, unfortunately, from my point of view. Um, but it's um, a lot of the writers go from that tack that you should control yourself. Now the thing is, when you're an emperor, you don't have to, or you could argue, well, I'm an emperor, so I'm supposed to do this. You know, this is actually me reacting to my emotions the way I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to have orgies and execute people and all these things. It's me being virtuous, giving into my role. Oh, I don't want to do it, honest. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it, it was a very important part of Rome. Um, but there's lots of other things, like they have a very, a very tiered society to the point where there's an old form of, um, I'm trying to remember the word, there's an old Roman word that's often translated as disgust, and basically what it means is it's the revulsion you feel when somebody not of their station is doing something. So somebody rich wearing poor people's clothes, somebody poor wearing rich people's clothes, somebody in one, one class eating the wrong food, all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, fastidium, that's it. Fastidium, from where we, from which we now get fastidious, even though it didn't quite mean the same thing. But it's sort of um, this feeling of people being, you should stick to your own, it was a very core part of Roman emotional hierarchy, their sort of regime that they lived under. Um, and uh, it's yeah, if you look through Rome, you see it all over the place, right, right down to the graves of poor people compared to the graves of rich people. You should never put a poor person in a tomb. That's not right, and vice versa. It's quite strict and this fastidium held a lot of power over the roman moral system of roman class system um yeah and then what about let's talk about the old testament new testament how did ancient hebrews think about uh human emotions specifically here i'm thinking about sin which which yeah. you know factors deeply into the christian worldview that we're born yeah. sinners original sin now they have this story about Adam and Eve in the garden and all that stuff. But is it kind of reflecting a real, a real kind of part of human nature that we are sinful? We are tempted by the passions and we are weak willed and we need discipline. We need a set of rules, 10 commandments or the yeah. 137 commandments of the Hebrews or whatever it is. <laughs> um, without that, you know, we, we will fall into sin. Yeah, it's, um, it is. It's, it's, it's them recognizing we need some rules. You know, they're much more, um, much more into their deontological um, thinking than the Greeks were. They were more, we need rules and you need to follow those rules. And if you break them, you're going to upset God. You're going to literally make him feel vile and yuck. And so don't break them. And that's sort of the, the key to sin. The sinning was something that really upset God right through to abomination that I mentioned earlier. The, word that's translated into one word recently but was lots of others um you had to be careful not to do that and that's kind of how they kept these laws in place not simply by saying don't do that they said if you do that big guy's gonna be upset and what you've got to do is quite complicated you need to go and buy a sheep and you need to take it into the temple and you need to make an arrangement have it sacrificed and everybody involved has to agree that that sacrifice is for their sin and then god likes the barbecue he likes the smell and he'll forgive you um and that sort of um the uh it, it spawned by the way a massive trade around the temple in jerusalem of sacrificial animals huge money to be made if you could bring in animals all the time for people to buy to sacrifice um so it was much more on um rules and punishments and penance um than the greeks were Right. So it's reflecting our human nature. This is sometimes called the the big gods hypothesis for the origins of religion. Yeah. It's a way of controlling the masses by saying, you know, we don't have extensive police forces around and we don't have uh, surveillance cameras, to, but there is yeah. one in the sky that sees everything you're yeah. doing. So be good <laughs> or else. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, big what do you think? Uh, is watching you. Right, right. <laughs> and, and 
Yeah. You know, does that work? Well, you guys in England, you have what cameras on every street corner now in London, I guess. It you know, it's, feels like it. This yeah. is the theory that that watched people are good people, right? You you think, mm. well, maybe I shouldn't shoplift because there's cameras or whatever. Otherwise, I might be tempted. So it's a it's a way yeah. of external control. Yeah, there are there are experiments done where they'll just put two dots on a piece of paper over something that people would take. And when they put the two dots in there, people won't take the cake or the money or whatever it is they use because there's so many people in this experiment. Just two dots. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. We seem to have this inbuilt worry of being observed uh, all the time when we're doing things. Although, to be fair, I got caught speeding about a year ago for six months. I was a good boy, a very good boy, and things kind of... I haven't sped since. That's not what I'm admitting here. That's not what I'm saying. But the temptation returns is all I'll say. So, Oh, um, I, absolutely. I, I go about two years. I get a speeding ticket every two years. Now I've got it figured <laughs> out where I, I, I kind of go along and just maybe 10 miles an hour above the speed limit until somebody blasts by me. And then that's my rabbit I can chase. And let him get the ticket. Yeah. And then I can bump it up <laughs> maybe another five miles an hour. But, you know, all that. Well, you know, I guess it's the difference between internal versus external control or locus of control, as it's called. Yeah. Ideally, in a yeah. self-governing society, you want people to have internal controls over their emotions and their behaviors. Yeah. Because we can't we can't police everything and we want our freedom and liberty. Yeah. I mean, the founding fathers of the United States famously, they weren't very religious, but they thought religion is probably a good thing because it gives mm. people an internal governor saying, yeah, I yeah. shouldn't do these things. Because you you need that for self governing people. We can't be everywhere, so this would be a good thing. Yeah, um, trying to instill morality and the right thing to do in people. I mean, we've got this ongoing thing in the UK where Boris Johnson keeps talking about the common sense of the British people will prevail during the pandemic, and then everybody has a massive beach party, and we go maybe not. Um, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, you can try. I mean, to be fair to my fellow Brits again, he said, we need to get boosters as quickly as possible, and we have queues round blocks for these boosters immediately. As he was announcing it, you couldn't get on the website to book one. So, you know, there is some internal, okay, yeah, we've got to do this. Um, and there was no rules, no point, if, no, if you don't do it, we're going to fine you. None of that, just, it's a good thing to do. So, yeah, I think um, that's where culture and societies work. That's where the cultural element of emotions comes from almost this um, way of controlling us to, well, not controlling us, but a way of instilling mor a morality um, and knowing if you do that, that feels good. If you do that, that feels bad. Why? Because that's the right thing to do and that's the wrong thing to do. Um, it goes. It's kind of linked to the Greeks. We're going back to the Greeks there, but it's not quite the same because sometimes we have to also add laws just to drive some of them home. Yeah, like, um, I had uh, uh, Michelle Gelfin on the podcast. She she studies a cultural psychology that, and and her thing is hmm. loose cultures versus tight cultures. So, so yes. <laughs> she did some research in the early stages of the pandemic, and that tight cultures like Germany. Uh, we're far better at, you know, locking things down and social distancing just because the people mm. are, you know, if the boss says to do this, okay, I'm, I'm going to do it. Whereas loose cultures yeah. like Japan and, and the United States are like, you know, the hell with that. I'm doing whatever I want. <laughs> and then they had a, a, a more rapid spread. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we're somewhere in between here. Um, some of us are a tight culture. Some of us are loose. Um, we don't quite have the uh, anti-mask movement. We do have like... Um, Jeremy Corbyn's brother going around ripping signs off tube trains to wear masks and things. So there's the, the odd little thing. But um, yeah, we're, we're a strange bunch. We will do as we're told to a point and then no more, I guess. Right. Yeah. So that, but that <laughs> gets us back to that kind of nature nurture to what extent cultures yep. do shape how you feel about things. Yes. Right. All right. So let's, let's kind of, uh, well, so back to the religious thing. I, 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 I'm fond of thinking about religion as, uh, you know, like things like the golden rule and the silver rule and the metallic variants of it as kind of early experiments in figuring out what human behavior is really like, what human nature is really like. And they got some things right. I mean, the golden rule just comes up over and over and over throughout history for a pretty good reason, yeah. right? That, that, you know, we have to interact with other people 
And then how would I feel if you, you know, you, if you did this to me, so I shouldn't do that to you. It's, it's, you know, so they yeah. got some things right inevitably by experiment. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, it's um, yeah, and it's a move on because when you go further back into those works, you find eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which is um, not incompatible with the golden rule. But I think later on, Jesus is the guy who says, "Oh, hang on, no, let's 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 put that to one side a little bit, and let's be nice to everybody because you know, um, they might be bigger than us." So, <laughs> so <laughs> right. <laughs> Or they may just feel differently than us, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the ex one example I used from one of my books was that experiment done where, um, yeah, I forget who the principal investigator was, but they 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 had uh, Shields walk up to somebody and say, in the first scenario, uh, these were college kids, single. So I found you attractive. Uh, I, I was wondering oh, uh, yeah. if you'd go out with me, you know. And, you know, it was 50-50 men, women saying yes. And then the second scenario was, hi, I saw you standing there. I found you attractive. I was wondering if you go back to my apartment with me tonight. And there the shift was dramatic. It was like, you know, 80, 20 gender split. And then the third scenario was, I saw you standing there, found you attractive. I was wondering if you'd have sex with me tonight. And there it went, you know, from, you know, 90% to zero, right? Not one person <laughs> in the, in the one gender said yes. And we know it, what the gender split is there. Uh, so <laughs> the idea, <laughs> and by the way, that was challenged. Uh, by some feminist scholars saying that no no it's just that the women f don't feel safe it's not that they don't want to have sex it's just that they don't feel safe well so then i guess it was repeated in which they made it clear you you'll be perfectly safe and by the way it's brad pitt asking you <laughs> if you want to have sex but, but that only bumped the, <laughs> the the yes rate from zero to like two <laughs> right so you know there was a male female difference in um, how many sexual partners you want, how many dates you're, you, you have to go on before you're, you'll have sex with the, with your date for women. I think it was seven dates for men. It was like, you know, how about right now <laughs> before the first day, right? <laughs> you know, these huge gender differences in, in, uh, in, in sexual, um, mating strategies. So the idea there back to the golden rule, well, how would I feel if a total stranger, attractive woman walked up to me and said, would you like to have sex? You know, most guys would go, well, yeah. And by the way, in that experiment, the guys who said no, they were apologetic about it. No, I'm really sorry my girlfriend's in doubt, but hey, call me when she's gone, right? I mean, it was pretty bad, you know, pretty an, an indictment <laughs> of, of the hum, human male nature. But the point is you can't just yeah. ask, how would I feel? That's not enough because maybe the other person doesn't feel the way you feel. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the experiments done by people who, in emotion research, it's actually... There's one, I have this list of possible books. And one of them is just to go on how brilliant some of these, just the experiments are. They're like magic tricks. They're genius. Yes. Um, the other classic one being the um, the classic Shek to Singo one, where they took two groups, told them they were going to get a vitamin shot. That's not what they were getting. They were not getting a vitamin shot, definitely. Um, but that's what they were told. So they all got their, their vitamin shot, and they went into two rooms, one with a very calm, actor saying oh, isn't this great i love getting involved in science isn't it wonderful another one with a guy going oh, i hate this what a waste of time why have i got to fill this stupid form and this is ridiculous um they've been hit with neuroadrenaline actually both groups and one group came out and said that they were really excited and that it was really fun and it was great and the other group came out and said oh, i'm really angry this is really annoying Ugh. and it turns out that excitement and and not being annoyed produce the same physical sensations, sweaty palms, elevated heart rate, um, butterflies in the stomach, all that kind of thing. Context matters. And I think what a brilliant way. I mean, I don't think the ethics committees would like secretly giving people neurochemicals these days, but I love that stuff. It's so clever. Yeah, it was kind of the guerrilla theater uh, period of yeah. time in social psychology yeah. <laughs> where it was perfectly okay to lock lock subjects up into fake prisons and get in and have people yes. uh, electrocute each other <laughs> stuff that would never <laughs> fly today. Um, no. well, okay. So that gets us to, you know, the, the Schechter singer theory of emotion. Uh, so let's talk about that. So it, that idea is that if you, uh, first make somebody feel a certain way by just a, a neurochemical injection, then they, after yep. the fact, find some words to describe what they're feeling, but it's not yep. the, um, how should I say this? Not the, 
concept or of the emotion, I'm I'm angry, and then my body responds. Is that my body is responding, and my my cognition is trying to rationalize this. Well, why do I feel this way? Oh, it's this this yeah. emotion. Yeah, it's the idea of appraisal. The idea that an emotion isn't just a stimulus response; it's a stimulus appraisal response. It's the you uh, look where you are. You look what the context is. You look what's happening around you. You think about your past and when you felt like this before. All these lots and lots of different things all factor into it and make you. Um, and then you decide that's what this feeling is. And all that, of course, doesn't happen. It's not like you sit there for ten minutes going, hmm, "I wonder what I feel." It just happens like that because that's how the brain works. Um, and you think, okay, so I'm angry because that guy wouldn't shut up all the time. I was trying to fill the form in. If you're on the other side, you feel much better. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's one of the, I mean, it's the opposite of people like, um, William James, who was very much on the, you have a physical sensation and then, yeah, then you feel something. It's, it's, um, (laughs) he had the opposite way around. Um, one of the big four, and I can remember all the big four, the big four theories. James' uh, theory, there's Schechter Singer, there is the one that happens at the same time, as there's five now, anyway. Um, and this is all, yeah. Um, like I say, emotions is one of those fields that um, we don't know yet, if we're honest. <laughs> really? And so there's lots yeah. of theories flying around that. Yeah. So, so let's there's just use an it, example. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'm hiking down a trail with the dog, and all of yeah. a sudden, I, I'm kind of jogging, and I come around the bed, and there's a rattlesnake. I, I live in Southern California. We yeah. have rattlesnakes. And they're, they're deadly. So I, I kind of leap over the thing, and, you know, like 10 seconds down the path, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, I, I'm just so scared. Yeah. But the, the theory would be, the one theory would be that, well, my body reacted. Yeah. I had a shot of adrenaline, and, yeah. and, my, and my muscles and blood pressure and everything has just changed. And then 10 seconds later or whatever, I think, wow, I'm scared. Yeah, that's one theory of emotion. Right? Yeah, that's that's the theory that there is this um, core affect, this immediate response that you have, and then the emotion is the baggage on top when you're walking away, going, "I know they got bitten by a snake. Oh, that's terrifying. Um, I hope it's not there when they go back. I hope it's not there tomorrow." Um, and the bit that gets to you is the appraisal bit, the bit where you start to think, "Right, I'm going for a walk again. Shall I go a different route? Because that snake might be there." Um, so, yeah. The idea is that my body has a certain chemical response. Maybe my amygdala yep. and limbic system then responds to that and readjusts mm-hmm. and so on. And then somewhere up the pathway to my cortex, where the concept of emotions lies, it, it then it then it appraises that whole system that just unfolded in you know microseconds or whatever. And so it's the, the, you know, the physical stuff happens first and then the psychological concept of emotions happens second. Yeah, that's, that's one of the ideas. The other idea is the, what's known as the psychological construct of emotions, which is the idea that all of it happens at once. So you will be aware that you're frightened and you'll be aware of the snake and jump over it. And your memory will remember that the snake is a danger because you've been taught that when you were younger. And you uh, have seen films where, particularly 80s cowboy films, where everyone gets bitten by a rattlesnake at some point. It's a rule. And, uh, and so all of that happens at once, not necessarily above the level of attention, not necessarily in the conscious mind, but it does all happen at once. So everything happens, you, every bit of your brain works at the same time. There is no sort of fear pathway. That bit, the amygdala bit, is just part of a grander thing that's going on. If you get past the snake, and then your attention goes, oh, hang on, what was that? Now, that's the moment you go, oh. And some would say that until that attention is brought to bear, you haven't felt fear, you've just reacted. Like any other species, like as an insect might. And then when you appraise it and go, oh, that was what in English would be fear, that's when you have fear. That's when you understand you had or have fear. Well, now, so my dog, of course, will jump over the snake and he'll go crazy and his hair will go up and so on. But he doesn't have yeah. the concept of, of fear. He doesn't know what fear no. is. I mean, as a concept, he doesn't have that cortex. No, but he does have he has a, a response to he, threat. He, could could, yeah, could we say the dog, he has, he has an emotion, 
or, or whatever. So here, this is the problem. What do we mean by this word emotion? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, this is a big problem because uh, there was a meta-analysis that studied definitions of emotion, and this is the most recent one. It was about 1992. And at that point, there was, a, I think it was 167 definitions floating around. It hasn't got better since. So uh, right. every, every, every other paper has, my definition of emotion is, and you read it, oh, no, not another one. <laughs> Can we just agree? Let's all get together. We need a big, like a Nicene Council thing where we all get together and we hash this out once and for all. Um, but that's because it's a kind of slippery subject. It's hard to say what they are. I mean, the classic of emotions is that emotions itself is a modern English box. It's a couple of hundred years old because before that, we didn't have emotions. We had affects and we had uh, passions, which are these the feelings I mentioned earlier the Greeks had that you felt in your soul and they went to your mind and we had sentiments and they're the ones that make you when you see someone doing something morally good you feel a pleasant sentiment and we had all sorts of little boxes and even now we've got um jack panskep the great neuroscientist and expert in emotions was once asked why he didn't consider disgust a basic emotion and he said well because then i'd have to consider hunger a basic emotion too because surely hunger is its opposite and so why isn't hunger an emotion so the li- even the, it's because the line as to what is and isn't emotion is kind of blurry. It's that fuzzy thing again. We, I think, really have to be a bit fuzzy. And so there are lots of definitions. People trying to draw their own line. Right. Yeah. So here the behaviorists kind of pushed back against all that and said, mm-hmm. we need an operational definition of what it is we're going to measure. Right. So yeah. we don't know what's going on up in the skull. So we'll just say, well, what is the organism doing and how can I count it? And then we can you yeah. know, study different uh, reinforcements and, and, and punishments and so on. But clearly that's too simplistic. You know, we can get inside the brain. So you have like you discussed in your book, the rage circuit, you know, the amygdala hypothalamus periaqueductal gray uh, that apparently yeah. gets like in a cat. If you, uh, you know, if you stimulate that with an electrode stuck in the brain, the cat goes crazy and tries to claw the eyes out of the experimenter and so on. It's not really angry. What would it be angry about? The experimenters being nice to it, but he, but it's just getting that trigger, and then it. But does it feel yeah. angry? What does that even mean? Yeah. Oh, what does that even mean? Um, one of the the difficulties of studying emotions in history is we always put in the caveat: we cannot tell you how people used to feel. We just can't do that. We can tell you how they used to talk about how they felt and how they used to paint their feelings or put their feelings in poetry or whatever, but we can't actually get inside their heads. It's, it's unfortunately not something historians can do yet. We need that technology. I think it's a way off, but we could do with it. It'd be great. Um, and so, but if you think about it, how do we know how anybody feels? Um, it's, it's a conundrum. And I think even people who are studying the psychology of emotion have the same issue we do in that, even if they put them in an fMRI machine, they're still taking them out of their real world and putting them in somewhere false and then trying to imagine, trying to measure ordinary emotional responses, which of course they can't be having emotional ordinary responses because they're lying on the back in a massive white tube that's making a huge amount of noise with headphones on being shown pictures. Um, although there's some good technology coming on stream for that. But mm. yeah, Like what? Like, uh, there's some things being done in virtual reality. Oh, so you can put right. a, you can put a mesh to track their uh, how their electrical stimulus is in the brain, and virtual reality goggles, and put them in certain scenarios and see what happens. So it's a bit more realistic than laying on your back in a massive white tube, um, and things like that, and uh, the sensitivity of smaller technology to read the brain with more precision and less intrusion. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big white tube. We're getting to the point soon. Where you can just put a cap on, you know. Um, I reckon we're ten years away from there being apps that you just put something on your head, and your app will say you're feeling a bit stressed. Calm down. Yes, um, yes, yeah, yeah. That's right. That internalized medicine will apply to psychology as well. Yeah, yeah. So th- this is tapping into the other minds problem. How do I know what what you're <clears throat> what you're thinking? How do I know you're not just a zombie, <clears throat> philosophical zombie, where the you know that. You, you express all the characteristics of being sentient, but the lights aren't on inside. Well, yeah. my solution to this is the Copernican principle. I'm not special. 
And if I feel a certain way and I see in your face and behavior similar things that I express when I feel that way, it's a good bet you're feeling the same way I am or pretty close to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's all great. And uh, it's it's um it's a good one. I mean, I think it's as good as any way to read someone's emotions. Um, be careful in other cultures. They ha- tend to have different facial expressions for things we now know. But what I'm starting to get interested in, towards the end of the book in particular, is how would we read, if we have a robot, an artificial machine that does all those things, it re- reacts the same way, pulls the same face, does everything, is it or is it not feeling something? How do we know? I mean, if you want to go into philosophy, anybody, that's the route to take because there's serious funding coming down that pike very soon. But yeah, how do we know? Yeah, yeah. I asked this question to um, a guy named David Ferrucci, who was the head of IBM's Watson program after Watson yeah. uh, competed in Jeopardy, the game show Jeopardy, and it beat the two all-time champions, Ken Jennings and the mm. And, uh, and so I asked him, did, did, does, does Watson know that he won Jeopardy? I mean, was he really excited? Like, oh, my God, I, I beat Ken Jennings, the all-time greatest. And he's like, well, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like, what does that even mean? He doesn't even know he's playing yeah. Jeopardy. It, and it, it's not even he, right? It's just, it, it's just a computer scanning and scraping through all the Wikipedia pages to try to answer yeah. these questions in, in microseconds. And it did that better. But it doesn't even know it's in a game, much like B- Big Blue doesn't know that it was even playing chess, much less that it beat Gary Kasparov. Yeah, yeah but there are. Um, Although, there's a whole. And so your point is that if you programmed yeah. it to say, "Yay, I won! I beat Gary Kasparov in chess," yeah, but that doesn't mean that it feels like like you and I would feel if we beat Gary Kasparov in chess, we'd be elated. Oh my God, this is I feel so good about myself. Yeah, but like, it's hard to imagine how how you would program a computer to do that. It is. There is a whole field called effective computing who are trying to do that. That's all they do. They want computers and um, robots and what machines in general to be able to detect your feelings and emote back and understand and feel. Uh, they will say feel for themselves, which is where it gets scary and the uh, robot overlords start to come into all this. But um, yeah, there's lots of people trying to do it, and it's it's even now there are pet animals that are being reviewed and this is absolutely true that are express their pet emotions so realistically that people refuse to switch them off they're sort of no because i feel like it's alive now that's part of the human tendency to put essences onto things i mean we put essences onto inanimate objects you know i've got a favorite guitar back there i'd cry if someone broke it you know um but this has taken that and supercharging it into it seems like it's real. I don't just put an essence on it, but it acts like that thing with that essence. So it's not just a teddy bear. It's coming up and it's sitting on my lap and it's wagging its tail and it seems pleased to see me when I get home and all these things. Um, so that's why I say I think there is a there is a difficult a difficult conversation to be had is when do we say these things are feeling? When when is that? Because is it when we think they are? Because then we get back to, well, the Copernican thing, well, I think you're feeling, therefore you must be. But I think that's feeling. Only that I know that it was built, you know? Right. So Right, yeah. We, we yeah. those essence, essentialism, yep. like the volleyball in the Tom Hanks movie, Cast Away, Wilson. And, you know, then Wilson yes, floats away and he's, he's sobbing at the loss. Yeah, I mean, we all kind of feel that way about things. It's easy to do. You know, I was thinking of Bruce Hood's research on, um, maybe it wasn't Hood. Who was it? I think you discussed this in original... the book of, would you wear Hitler's sweater or jacket or something yeah. like that? That was Paul Rosen like, originally. Paul Rosen. Uh, the great yeah. Paul Rosen, yeah, who um, who basically said, would people wear this sweater um, for a financial reward, some money? And lots of people said, yes. And they said, it was Hitler's. And they all, pretty much all said, actually, no. And it was just a sweater. And he even said, it's also been worn by, well, he said Mother Teresa. That's a whole other discussion. But he said Mother Teresa. <laughs> uh, and people still said, no, uh, it's, it was Hitler's. Um, and it's this essentialism. And Bruce Hood followed it up. He's done some great follow-up work on that. Um, 
him and his team. So that's probably why you remember because it's in uh, his book. Right. Um, he talks about it. And then he did something with, uh, I think it was Bruce who did this, of uh, putting Brad's, Brad Pitt's shirt for sale on eBay, washed versus unwashed with the two conditions. Yeah. And the unwashed version got a much higher, you know, because you want the essence of Bradness, like, ooh, his sweat is in yes. his essences. Yeah. Uh, but there is something yeah, to that cause... because, right, remember the T-shirt, um, the smelling the T-shirt experiment with undergraduate um, uh, men and women, you know, both wore T-shirts for a day and then then they would smell them and, and experimenters asked, what what would what's the likelihood you'd go out with this person or something? And there was something about this certain smells that were more attractive than others and had something to do with the <laughs> genetic similarity or whatever. Some, forget the details of that. But but that idea that a, a, a sexual partner or a romantic partner has a certain smell mm. to them that is part of their essence that you like or you don't like. And that's yeah. kind of a tapping a deeper emotion. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, smells and emotion is a... Um is a very is a it's something i would like to look at my i have a colleague uh will and he is a historian of sm- scent and smell and he has got towards emotion a lot because you can't avoid it with smell and i'm um one of these days we're going to do something together we're going to work on a paper together it has to happen but he's uh he's he he looks at the early modern period and looks at the ways that people have tried to how they understood smell and how they, what smells they liked and what they didn't. And again, a lot of it's down to that upbringing, you know, what you're used to. Because the early modern world didn't smell as badly as people think it did. They didn't bathe very much, but they did have pristine clothes. So there was a balance there, um, I guess. Um, right. So moving up historically in your book, you talk about the witch crazes, which I, I've read a lot about. Ah. Fascinating. And always wondering. What were these people thinking? You know, you're standing there watching an execution, burning a woman alive. So it's, it must have been horrible. They must have been screaming. And, and mm, what are they thinking? Are they thinking this is this is good for them, or maybe it doesn't hurt as bad, or this is good for their soul? We're saving their soul for Jesus or whatever, and casting out the demons. Yeah, how do you think about that? Um, most of them are thinking, um, sadly. These are de- the Satan's foot soldiers in the end times, and we are taking them out off the earth. We are cleansing them from the earth. Um, it's that essentialism thing. Bruce Hood like this, actually. It's the idea that um, these are an, a contamination on the earth, harbingers of the end times, and we need to um, rid them with fire, and particularly fire outside the UK, outside England, um, because fire is the ultimate punishment it means you will not be bodily brought back to life on judgment day there is no body to be bodily brought back so you're gone forever that's it you're in hell or you're in nothingness or depends who you speak to um and there were people obviously a lot of writers who said this is horrific this is terrible but unfortunately there were a lot who said this needs to be done because it's the end times we are absolutely certain it's the end times because there's always someone who thinks it's the end times but right back then there was a lot of them um and these are a manifestation of that. Therefore, they need cleansing. I mean, there needs to be no way for them to return to do any more harm. Um, it's a it's not a good time in history, to be quite honest. Um, in the in England, we tended to hang them because we still had this. They still had this old fashioned idea that it was a just heresy. It was a it was um more of a sin to claim you're a witch. You're being silly. You're being stupid. You you're not really a witch. And if you won't say that you're not, then we'll hang you for it. Whereas in Europe, it was heresy. It was idolatry, in fact, which is as bad as it gets um, because you are saying you're imbued by the Satan. And so um, they would feel that abomination that I mentioned earlier, which is this deep revulsion for sin, was as powerful as it could get with witches. And so they want them cleansed um, from the earth. Yeah, but so if you're standing there watching, where is the empathy circuit? When you're listening to the woman screaming, doesn't your own empathy circuit kick in? Or maybe they just didn't have it developed because they it was overridden. Or is it more like this virtue ethics thing? Like, we have to do this because this is good for society. This is good for her. It's good for the whole thing. And yeah, it sounds terrible. And I feel bad for her, kind of. But really, this is better, better for all of us. We have to bite the bullet and do it. 
I suspect in some people it was that. It was the virtual thing. It was the, this has to be done. The earth has to be cleansed of these sinners because otherwise uh, the devil will be here. The Antichrist is already here, a lot of them thought. Um, and the devil will be coming for us. Uh, other people, it's, it's disassociation. It's de dehumanizing. They weren't human. So they weren't human women that were crying. They were demons. They were witches that were making noises. Um, a similar thing, the famous thing is when Nazi Germany would compare the Jewish population to rats that needed exterminating in films. The terrible things they did there. Um, it's that kind of dehumanizing um, that can set you apart from something. So if you can make somebody to be inhuman, we humans are capable of terrible things. When we say that group of humans aren't humans anymore, we can do a... <laughs> apocalyptic things to them um holocaust witch burnings genocide um and that's um that's one of the i think one of the biggest issues that witches were just they weren't humans they weren't women screaming they were witches and witches need you know and i would suggest that we have an inner sense of right and wrong and empathy and you have to override that by in this case dehumanizing or like slaveholders yeah you know, I, I have this mm. constant debate in my mind about not judging people of the past by a current moral standards that were established last week, <laughs> you know, and so-and-so said this thing back in 1965 and, you know, wasn't he evil? Well, probably these people in 1965 weren't thinking the way we think about gays and yeah. blacks and Jews and so on. Um, so it's not really fair for me to judge them. But on the other hand, if you have to lock somebody up and use chains and whips, you have to know on some level they don't want to be slaves. They're trying to escape. Right, so then you yeah. had, then something would have to kick in to override that, which is they're not actually humans. We're actually saving their soul, and we're giving them civilization. Yeah, and life is better here on the plantation than it was in Africa. And you have all these rationalizations yeah. going along. Yeah, yeah, rationalizations. The idea that you know um, they aren't the same. They may be humans, but they're not humans like us. They're sort of further down the evolutionary ladder. That kind of rationalization was a. Uh, not uncommon, um, you know, which is why when the uh, the Haitian Revolution happened and a bunch of these people who are lower down on the evolutionary ladder beat Napoleon, the it scared a lot of people, you know, um, a lot of white people. Right, let me get that right. He scared a lot of white people because we can't beat Napoleon. They beat Napoleon. Hang on a minute. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, it's, but, it's but a it frightening thing, that, the power... Of... It suggests that there is something in us that, you know, is mm. sort of that, that good and evil side of, of us. It's both. Like in, in um, Christopher Browning's book, Ordinary Men, he, he writes about this police battalion that was brought out to the, uh, I think it was the Eastern Front, to kill Jews in Poland, you know, at the, at the, mm. you know, at, at the pit, and, and they just shoot him in the head. Wow. And so on. Well, it was difficult for a lot of these guys to get into it, but they eventually got into it, you know, it, the... Wow. The yeah. more distance, using a rifle rather than a pistol, right, right, right next to their head, and so on. And gassing is even better because then, then there's no blood splattering, and so on. And that you have to put yeah. distance between people, and it takes some uh, training and practice to kill people like that. And also, apparently, alcohol yeah. was involved. A lot of them got shit faced after they did this to kind of deal with, you know, this really didn't feel comfortable doing this. <laughs> so it takes yeah. a lot to do that, which suggests that we do have a good side in, in us. Yeah, I think I mean I think it takes a lot to be um to be made to see people as not humans when they are speaking a language and pleading for their lives and that kind of thing. Um it's converse to what I was saying about the air animals. It doesn't take much for us to think that they are alive and they we should treat them right. Um there's a scene, a wonderful scene that I've always liked in uh what's the series called? Um The Good Place where the computer that runs the thing has a button and if you hit it, it switches her off. But if you go near the switch, she pleads for a life. And then you back away, she goes, I'm not really real. Don't worry, this pleading isn't real. And you can hear, she goes, please don't give me, please don't give me, please don't give me. And then they, they back off again. She says, that was all fake. I'm not really I'm real. I'm a machine. And yet people can't press the button. And so to get to that button takes a lot. It takes a lot of stripping away you almost have to feel like these things have no and again your emotions have to be not so much suppressed but changed you have to think of these things as being vile as being with 
repulsive and disgusting and has to be stopped or a massive danger to you that has to be stopped. You have to be somehow convinced of that. And then you have to get over your own internal. Well, we don't raise to kill. Humans don't like to kill other humans, really. Um, it's not something we do. And from being very young, we're taught not to do it. So all this development, possibly internal genetic, don't kill other humans, because if you do, our species will cease to exist. And that's not a good idea. Um, that has to be stepped over. And so the there's a concept called emotional regimes, which is the idea that you live within a bubble of how you're allowed to express and understand emotions within your culture. The classic being there's an air steward on an airline. He's in the, he's not just first class. He's sort of um, as posh as it can get. He's the front seat, first class, special butler given to the richest person on the planet. So, you know, Bill Gates or Elon Musk is in that seat. And whoever it is, is incredibly rude. But that person has to, because it's their emotional regime, say, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I'd I'm, I'm, I'm be happy to do that, sir. And express, try to actually feel happy about doing that. If they're really good at their job, to get to that position, you won't just pretend to be happy. You will be. You'll be able to you just have a thick skin and be able to carry on. And so you have to, in order to get people to do something horrific, like shoot people and put them in a ditch, flip their emotional regime from the one they've been brought up with is you don't kill people you don't hurt people you don't do that to one where you do because they're a threat because they're a danger because they are revolting is the quickest way make them disgusting is a really short quick shortcut um and it's it's um something that sadly the nazis were really good at and really good at it um and you'll find people who do horrific things are all really good at it um, it's a gift that yes, seem that, to have. In that virtue ethics way, we are cleansing our society of Jews because they're evil, and this will make our society mm. more virtuous, better. We're getting rid of the unvirtuous yes. people, something like that. Right. Oh, yeah, they thought they were doing it for the greater good. I mean, they weren't, but they genuinely believe they were. That Right, yeah. Yeah, even Milgram's shock experiments, you know, you know yeah. if you read those scripts, they really have to push mm. the subjects, you know, because the subjects are squirming and they're objecting and yeah. they're turning around saying, are you sure this is okay? Yes, you must continue. I must continue? Yes. All right. And then they do a couple more toggle switches and like, are you sure? Can, can we check on that guy? Because he's screaming. You have to continue. Yeah. All right. And, yeah. the, you know, you can see that they don't really want to do it. It's just like, well, okay, I'm just going to go along with this. Yeah, because of the authority. Um, and authority yeah. seems to be able to drive, allow people to put feelings in a box sometimes. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very dark side of emotion. I was thinking of another experiment. Uh, I had Richard Nisbet on the podcast, and, and he's famous for that experiment of the difference between northern cultures and southern cultures in their response to um, insults uh, and slights, and that southern culture... People from the South, Southern United States, um, have a more of a hair trigger because they've kind of been raised with this culture of honor that you don't call the authorities, mm -hmm. you settle these little things yourself with the other person that insulted you or whatever. And Northern people are, are more kind of democratic law and order, call the police, call the authorities and let them settle this issue. I'm kind of overgeneralizing here, but that's the idea. And that, uh, so his experiment, he has the subjects fill out a form and they have to walk down this hallway to turn it into this other room. Of course, this is, you know, social psychology where they lie about everything. And so in the, in the hallway, there's some guy working away at a locker. I don't know what he's doing. And when the subject walks by, he kind of bumps him and says, asshole. And uh, so the students from the Northern States uh, were like, oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. And they were apologetic about it. the students from the Southern <laughs> States were like, you want to take this outside, buddy? And then he, he drew their blood. <laughs> and the Southern students had, you know, increased stress hormones and testosterone levels went up and they're ready to, you know, get it on with this guy. Yeah. And, and, the, and the Northern students were, you know, more apologetic. So his theory is that the Southern states were populated by more mountainous people from mountainous regions in the UK and Europe. Where, and, and so they had to develop kind of this culture of honor because there is no, uh, the long arm of the law is not there. So you have to settle these things yourself. Yeah. Whereas it, where the people in, in the New England states were populated by 
by more uh, farmers who had, you know, fences and laws and rules, and they were used to, you know, turning to somebody like that. So that's an interesting difference in emotional response. It is, yeah. It's it's actually going back to the uh, witch trials. Um, one of the main differences between Europe, where you had the massive, massive witch crazes and burnings, and England, where you didn't, you had hangings, is law and order. Because in Europe, there was uh, not much of it. There, was not, there wasn't a strict sort of um, code of law that people stuck to because of mountains and the hills, and it's very big. And so things could get out of hand in small towns where they took it upon themselves or called in an inquisitor or called in somebody who was going to make a bit of money off everybody that died. Unfortunately, that happened a lot. Um, and things would explode. Whereas in Britain, you had to go to a court, you had to go to a secular court, you had to see a judge, you had to do all proper and above, above, above board. And blah. and so we had many, many fewer people killed as witches in England. And when they were, they tended to be hung. Um, and it's a similar, different kind of, uh, it comes back to that culture thing that you're raised to it, emote in certain ways, depending on how you're raised. Um, and some people, I mean, we British, we we apolog- we would we'd apologise to someone for punching us in the face. You know, we're far too apologetic <laughs> half the time. So, I'm sorry you felt you had to do oh, that. Didn't my nose get in the way? It's <laughs> <laughs> really funny. Yeah. So back to theories of emotion. So those students from the south that get enraged when insulted. Yeah. Do, do, do the does their you know stress levels in their blood and testosterone and so on go up? And then they feel angry and slighted, or do they feel angry and slighted, and that produces the increase in stress hormones? Um, or maybe my we answer, don't know. And my answer, and the answer that seems to be becoming more frequent is the is my favorite answer, which is yes, and that is that they <laughs> feel slighted as their test their hormones go up. It's all a single process, not that and then that. It's a thing that happens together, um, and. The extent to which it happens is the extent to the reaction. So if they feel a bit slighted and their hormones go up a bit, at the same time, they may just ignore it the first time and then get angry the second time. But if it goes crazy, then... But it's um, it's that um, psychological construction again. It's a whole thing all happening, and the body as well. The body's implicated in this. We release chemicals in our bodies. That's why we feel things. That's why we have gut feelings and that sort of thing. Um, and it's not a... Uh, if you're like a a circuit, it's not that, then that, then that, then that. It's just a boom. Everything's lit up. It's like switching a light switch. Boom. Um, rather than it being... Because emotions have to be quick. They're emotions that keep you alive. Yeah, right. So these like things milliseconds. Very quickly. Yeah. So it's better that the brain works, does it all at once, and it's boom, rather than trickles things. I mean, by trickles, I mean it takes millionth of a millisecond rather than a trillionth of a millisecond but you know <laughs> right 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 still very fast well this this makes me think of the these experiments where you try to change your behavior to change your emotions like the one where if you have somebody mm. put a pencil in their mouth uh, like that so they're kind of smiling yeah. and then somebody tells a joke and those people think it's funnier than if you're holding the pencil like this and your lips yeah. are pursed so you're not smiling and they don't find the the, the joke is funny. Now, I'm, I'm told by people that study this that that didn't survive the replication crisis in psychology, but Nisbet told me it has been replicated, so I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and then there, then there's the, yeah. the other one, the power pose, Amy Cuddy's famous power pose, where and she made this famous on a TED Talk that's been seen by, like, I don't know, 50 million people or something, where if you pose, yeah. you know, the power pose, shoulders up, chest out, chin up, you know, confident, then you go in to ask for the raise or, you know, demand the promotion or whatever, you're more likely to get it because it changes your confidence, your stress, whatever your hormones of confidence, whatever that would be. And so you act differently by first behaving differently, then you feel differently, and then you act differently again. And the people around you will respond differently because you're a power poser. And I was at that TED conference when she gave that talk. And I remember people walking around afterwards <laughs> with their shoulders back and their chest up like, oh, I'm power oh. posing. And it, but again, I, I think that's one of those ones that maybe didn't survive the replication crisis. People are not able to replicate that. You know, what yeah. are your thoughts on some of that that research? Oh well, the, the the power pose. There are pictures of members of the British government around that just <laughs> after that who look like they've <laughs> lost their skis. You know, their legs <laughs> wide apart. And it's like, what are you <laughs> <Right>. doing? <laughs> Loads of them. Um, right. 
There's a wonderful one of the, uh, the last Prime Minister Theresa May doing it, and you sort of your heels are too high. What's what's this? Um, yeah, there is a picture of Bush I, and I mean, and, um, and, and um, Tony Blair both kind of walking like they were cowboys yeah. in Texas. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. but <laughs> yeah, the um, replication crisis is an issue. But I don't know. I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, I've tried to do things like that trying to be all confident and unconfident and I maybe am for five minutes but there's also things like is it that they see you looking confident they treat you as if you are confident and so you feel confident is there a feedback going on here is it not just you it's kind of a circular thing um there's a lot needs to be redone and um looked at more I think um and so it's yeah it's it's hard to say what's actually going on there. Where it, I, I, I personally think that's it. I think half the time, if you're smiling, someone tells you a joke. Um, I don't see how that. <laughs> it depends what mood you're in. Um, depends on the joke. I mean, what are the jokes? One of the things that cause the trouble in the replication is really bad methodologies and people saying one people one thing, another people other things. And sometimes I wonder about that experiment. What were the jokes? Um, right. <laughs> yeah, because that would make a difference. <laughs> huge difference. Um, and who are they giving the pencils to? And are they all just American college students? Um, yes, yes, probably. I'll go there. <laughs> Let's not get the, weird. The weird, um, the weird people, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, I, I... This is the problem, again. You get a paper that says this. I think the best description of how emotion science is at the moment, um, it came from a friend of mine, Robin Ince, a comedian, and he said he reads a lot of 19th century, sort of late 1890s, 1900 papers on evolution. And all these papers are confident. They know everything about evolution. They are absolutely certain of everything they write. And they're so wrong, it's laughable when you read them now. They're brilliant. They're coherent. They're wrong. And a lot of the emotion papers a bit like that you read them and go yeah makes sense probably wrong though <laughs> you know? and i think we're gonna have a i think there will be a dna moment because of these new technologies where we go okay let's put those over there let's forget those and let's get this new science in there um and i think that one of those the whether you can feel good whether your body's feedback affects your feelings i mean it probably does because that's part of it um like I was saying, it's not just the brain. That's the big thing that's happening at the moment. The emotions are going beyond the brain and saying, hang on, what does the rest of the body do to our feelings? Surely there is interconnectedness there. Because yeah, you mentioned feeling different for five minutes. It could be that it yeah. does affect it, affect your emotions for a little while. Um, here I was yeah. thinking of uh, the, the self-help movement, self-help and actualization movement, which is the, the acronym <laughs> yeah. is SHAM. <laughs> Because it doesn't seem to work or does it? <laughs> so we had this uh, story in Skeptic uh, by a, a guy that worked at Rodale Press, who's the largest publisher of self-help right. books. And, and he told us that the, the number one predictor of who would buy a self-help book and the tapes and all that is people that have already bought self-help books. Well, if it works, why do you need to keep buying them? Yeah. <laughs> and, and it yeah. could be that it... it Absolutely. It, 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 or, you know, these corporations that hire these um, self-help gurus like Tony Robbins uh, and the chicken soup for the soul guy. Uh, and, and all those, and they pay a lot of money for these people to come in and, you know, it bumps up sales for a while. Apparently, you know, the sales force is all motivated. I'm going to get in there Monday and hit the phones and, and, it, but, but, but yeah. they, they kind of have a regression to the mean back where they started after a couple of weeks. So you have to, they have to kind of uh, re up it constantly. Like here's, listen to the tapes every week or, you know, do your mantra or, or reread that chapter in the book or whatever, but it may only work just temporarily. Hmm. Yeah, I I think a lot of it. somebody actually said that my book was a bit of a self help book, which I thought. <laughs> but, um, okay, I'll take that. If you want to put yeah. it, if you want to put it on that rack and get me in the bestseller list, go for it. But no, it's not. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, it's self help is is a curious thing. I've been really interested in self help for a long time, ever since. Once upon a time, I used to read a lot of them, including the classics, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, um, and so on. And uh, they always do seem to work for a bit. You go, yeah, yeah, I'll do these things and I'll, I'll 
feel better and I'll be motivated. And, and then it drops. And it's a bit like what we're saying about the speeding thing that I was motivated. I was given something, something to do to motivate me to be good. And uh, if there's any police listening, it's still working. <laughs> it's genuinely still working right. to this day. Um, so uh, I think one of the things that one of the many definitions of emotions, one of Paul Ekman's uh, definitions of emotions mm -hmm. is that they are unbidden and they are short lived. So if you're trying to create something to tap into emotions, then it's going to be short lived by the very nation of what nature, nature, nature of what they are. These chemicals can't hang around in your body forever. That tie you out, you know, you'd sleep 12 hours, 20 hours a day if you felt it all the time. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably it. Um, there are now mood things. Mood's a different thing. Mood's more long-term. Mood is, will keep you in good mood. Um, and um, I'm not sure how much more successful they will be. Um, they have gone onto phones. There are apps like Mood Mapper and things. Really? With your long-term moods. Yeah. So that would be it. different, say, if I feel angry, maybe that last 10 seconds or a minute. Uh, versus yeah. sad, where I, I just kind of have a, a malaise for the entire day. I just don't feel yeah. happy, and I don't really know why. That would be different. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 being thought of more as a different thing. The more there are longer moods, are more of a longer term set of feelings, whereas as uh, emotions are these short term things that come on bid and then go. So sadness, as opposed to being sad. Sadness is more uh, a mood, it's more long term, and it's sort of your equilibrium within your body, for lack of a better term, has settled somewhere slightly off kilter and stays there for a while. So you're producing small amounts of neuro, uh, neurotoxins and whatever chemicals that will keep you feeling down. Um, whereas emotions, it's just a blast. You know, the chemicals go poof, the brain goes bang, and then it calms down. Because, like I say, if it stayed like that, You'd be asleep all the time. <laughs> you wouldn't feel much at all. Yeah. Wake up and go, ah, pretty... and then fall asleep again. So. <laughs> kind of a funny example of uh, the effect of, of blood chemistry on, on emotions. Uh, so the other day, mm. last weekend, we went to, from Santa Barbara here up to Cambria. It's about a two-hour drive. Anyway, the only thing I'd had to eat all day was a banana. And I had my workout in the morning and so yeah. on. And, and by the time we got up there, it was like 3.30 in the afternoon. And my wife and, and young son and I decided, well, let's, get, let's have an early dinner. And for like hours, I was feeling just kind of blue and down and I couldn't figure it out. Maybe it was because that social media comment that upset me or I didn't get a call from my friend or, you know, whatever it was. And I'm just kind of grinding through what could it be? Anyway, then I ordered this big old hamburger with a reduction sauce and mushrooms. And I get about halfway through this hamburger and all of a sudden I'm in the best mood. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. blood sugar. Can it really be that simple? Just blood sugar. It <laughs> Yeah, it can be that simple. It can be hangry is a real emotion. Um, yeah, we we all we all get hangry from time to time. Uh, um, the new emotion, <laughs> there's a concept of emotion called found emotions, which are new things that we mm. create. Hangry being one of them. Um, okay, I heard that one. The other one. Yeah, that's that's one. Um, I think it was invented by a Snickers advert. Funnily enough, mm. and it became mm. a bit of a meme. Of course, people are hangry. Right. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, what was the other one that was really popular a year ago? Do you think of hunger as an emotion or more of a drive? And here's those words. Again. Exactly. A good question. Uh, is it? Um, apparently, disgust can't be an emotion if hungry is, but is hunger an emotion? I think I would personally see hungry as a drive um, to a point, and then it can co-opt emotions. So you can become angry when you get a certain hungry to a certain point. Um, why we do that? That's a good question. Maybe it's to create more of a drive. Maybe it's, I need to eat now. As opposed to, I need to eat now. And if you like that because you need to eat, then you'll probably tear the head off the nearest thing you can find and eat it in a survival situation. Rather than go hunting for something nice. Um, yeah, hunger's hunger's up there with physical pain, and there's a few others that are sort of is that an emotion? Is a headache an emotion? Well, no, but why not? Because it's a feeling and it's internal, so why not? Um, it can certainly create emotions. 
Uh, can it me? It's, oh no, I've got my brother-in-law's COVID. It was the most recent headache I had. Uh, so, um, right, so how would you distinguish them. between, say, on that, along those lines, between lust and love? You know, I think of lust, you know, just oh. want to have sex. That's a kind of a drive, but being in love is a deeper emotion, it seems like. How do researchers think about that? Yeah. I mean, there's quite a few different areas. Love is, um, some people think love is a collection of other feelings that we label love. So a desire and a drive to reproduce and a belongingness, wanting to belong to someone. So oxytocin, which is very much the belongingness chemical. It makes you want to be with people and stay with them. Um, and it's often called a love drug, but it's not quite. It's, you know, you, you feel it for your brother. Um, and, and you feel it for your partner. And they're two very different loves. So obviously it's not the one chemical doing the whole thing. There's differences there. Um, but love is, um, love is, there's a, a, there's a love, which is often within psychological literature thought of as sort of the, um, if you like the long-term feelings of belongingness with a partner, long-term partner. There's something called limerence, which is that hot, sweaty first fortnight. You know, that's sort of you can't think about anyone else. You can't get away from them, you, um, which is tied up with lust, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so love is interesting that it's not a thing. We always talk about it being a thing, but it's kind of this basket of things. Um, and we have different versions of it for different situations. Um, there's self-love and there's uh, love for others, which are very different because one of them is quite internal and selfish at times. The other one. Is the opposite. It's selfless. Um, and yeah, love is, uh, is, a, is a complicated one. Love is also responsible for some awful things like the Crusades, who were crusading. It's one theory is because they have been given Christian, a shot of Christian love, that they should take back the Holy Land that they loved for the Christ that they loved and for the fellow Christians that were getting attacked that they loved. So you can use love, caritas, which is sort of a charitable love, to um, get people to do bad things too. So we always think of love as positive, but it's not always. I mean, there are other, we can all think bad situations that come from love, I'm sure. But that, I think, is historically quite a big one. Um, With the example you used in your book of, you know, Kennedy's speech at Rice about we're going to land a man on the yeah. moon and bring him back and so on. As, as kind of love of one's country, although I the, the, yes. think of that as more of pride of one's country or nationalism, you know, how, yeah. how do you kind of tease those apart? Um, it's difficult. I mean, I think a lot of the rhetoric at the time was love. It was sort of, you must love your country, love of the love of the fatherland, the motherland. The Soviets were very big on it too, very big on it. They wanted to create this love for the Soviet uh, ideal through the new Soviet man whatever that was, it was sort of this perfect worker man who never really existed. Um, and in America, it was, you know, love your country, love your state. It goes back to the uh, earlier wars in the 19th century in America. They sort of, because one paper I read believes that because America doesn't have a long history of its own, so it's, a, it's a very much a um, collection, they created love for this thing you'd got, this wonderful thing you have. We're going to love it and treat it like it's, our child or our parent. Um, and that helped galvanize the country in 1812 and other such situations. Um, and it's still after the Second World War that was infused a little bit more. And it was a way to say, yes, I know you're still on rations and there's this terrible war going off over in Vietnam, but rockets, um, isn't this lovely? Look at these rockets. Uh, and we're not doing this because we're worried about nuclear weapons. No, we just want to go to the moon. Honest. Um, and so you just make people very prideful. Now, difference between pride and love. Yeah. Well, that is a question. Can you love something unless you have pride in it? I don't know. Right. But like I say, right. love is a basket of things. And within that basket, pride sits, you know, but there's this I thing I'm happy about that and pleased about and you can feed that bit pride to make the love bigger yeah here i was thinking of the fictive kinship groups which would be like the band of brothers yeah. these are total strangers in an army group say but then you uh extrapolate from there out to the nation so that you know the, the uh yeah 
the motherland, the fatherland. These are these are yeah. family metaphors meant to tap into your evolved emotions. Well, of course I care about my family. Of course I care about my yeah. kin and kind. These are my people. Yeah. And then you just you just expand that sphere and include everybody in our nation, but not those people over there because they're the the enemy. Yeah, they're the out group. You, you expand your in group. Say we are this, and we are this because we are not to that. That is something else. We are not to that. We oppose that, and that's what defines us as being us. And so we love this, thing, and we love what we are, and we can feel prideful, and we can feel happy about being this group. But they can't, and of course, they over there are doing exactly the same thing back and back at you, saying we are not that. Um, and it's you know the number of psychological psychology papers on in groups and out groups and sociology papers that show this that people within in groups will allow transgressions that they won't allow of the out group uh, so somebody steals something within the in group you might let them off someone in the out group there's no way um they're in the tens of thousands by now i don't think the the uh the replication crisis is going to hurt those very much because there's so many of them it's being replicated over and over um and that taps into that love again. It's sort of love. It's a broad thing. Yeah, we love our in-group. We love people in groups. And uh, the closer they are to the centre, the more we have that oxytocinal. I've just invented a word. But that oxytocin <laughs> rush that binds yeah. us to them. Um, and it gets weaker as it goes out. But, it, you know... I think I've heard a journalist once say there was kind of a golden rule. This is in the UK that um, one Brit is worth two Europeans. One European is worth five non-Europeans, you know, when you're saying the news, because somebody will crash a bus and it'll be headline news while a genocide is going off that doesn't get on there. We all see the Twitters. Why aren't they talking about this? It's partly because of this weird in-group oxytocin all. Somebody better write that down. It's mine. Um, <laughs> feeling that that gets weaker as we get out. So when we can't even imagine somebody's existence or life, there's no belongingness there. So it doesn't make the news, sadly. We only can make the bubble bigger. Put our arms around the world. Well, that's yeah. the idea, right? Burn Peter Singer's bigger. expanding circle, or uh, I, yeah. I prefer the three-dimensional metaphor of expanding sphere. Uh, you know, yeah. Peter wrote this back in the seventies about how we become more inclusive and that's gotten even mm. better. You know, now, you know, same sex marriage and women's rights and LGBTQ rights and so on. Uh, and yet we yeah. still have a long ways to go, uh, to expand the circle to include everybody as equal rights yes. bearing, uh, members of our tribe. The tribe is the human species. That's it. Everybody in it. Yeah, and maybe we expand it uh, as as Peter Singer would like to do to the great apes, and maybe the cetaceans yeah. like dolphins and whales and and porpoises and so on, and and just keep going. And uh, seems like yeah. <clears throat> we're a long ways from that, though. Yeah, I think we are. Um, sadly, I mean, I've recently, I've recently found that I've accidentally become a hippie in that I have an electric vehicle. I'm vegan, um, and <laughs> I found the best way to do yoga. So. Uh, <laughs> I didn't mean to. Sorry. Um, now, are you, yeah, are you I, vegan I, I, for, I, for moral reasons or health reasons or both? Mostly, actually, for health reasons, because all of a sudden you reach a certain age in your life and things start happening to your body. In my case, I ate meat. I got gout in my ankle. So I thought, you know what? Easiest way to not, easiest way to be able to walk is to not eat the meat. So that's why I've done it. But, you know, there, nice. I, I get the moral arguments as well. Um, oh, that's they, why they have good arguments. They, they have very yeah. good arguments, uh, but still, when it comes time, there's that burger. Oh my god! Well, yeah, I'll uh, just go. I'll just do uh, this, uh, and then <laughs> I have been making the argument recently that people who were vegan in the '80s, I have so much respect for because now, for the most part, you're just changing brands. You want a burger? Well, there's a Beyond Burger. It's ninety-five percent as good. You want whatever? There's a vegan i had some vegan fish sticks and they were exactly the same um i don't know how good the, all this processed stuff is for you but um yeah well there is that argument that they're have... so full of chemicals you're it's still healthier to eat meat but yeah. we'll we'll set that aside all yeah. right let's let's kind of bring it up <laughs> to the present 
Um, so in, yeah. in 1977, I was in a psych graduate program and I took a course in ethology. And this was our textbook, which is Ibel, right. uh, Arrhenius, Ibel, Ibisfeld. I know you know this book, uh, Ethology, the Biology of Behavior. Now this is called, what, evolutionary psychology or sociobiology or whatever. But uh, Ibisfeld had these um, experiments in which he went around the world with this unusual camera. So here's the camera just for people that are watching this. So the actual lens is on the side of the big lens. So people think that he's looking, you know, that direction. Actually, he's, he's filming them from the side so they don't know that they're being filmed. And, of course, he takes these now famous pictures that, you know, er everybody around the world has similar uh, facial expressions like happiness or surprise or whatever. And, yeah. and one, more, one more picture of this is, you know, people smiling in a certain way from different cultures. So this was kind of in response to this kind of blank slate that emotions are all just culture. And he's going, no, no, no. Yeah. There's a universal set of emotions. And now let's bring that up to uh, Lisa um, uh, Feldman Barrett, who, you know, who has famously challenged this very strongly. So mm. kind of outline what's the terms of the debate and where are we at this moment about culture and uh, versus nature on this? Yeah, the terms of the debate, another strong one is Paul Ekman, who is um, a, very important in this. He came up with the idea that there are six basic emotions, which he himself doesn't hold to now. I think he's got thinks there are 14. Six of oh. them you can see on the face, others you can see in other ways. Um, what, what were the six and, again? Uh, they are, here, you're testing me here, happiness, sadness, surprise, disgust, anger, and fear. Okay, right. If you've seen, if you've seen, um, if you've seen Disney, John, what's he called again? Inside Out. They have five of them. They didn't do Surprise. They did the other five. Um, there is a sequel that has all fourteen coming. Funnily enough, <laughs> um, being made at the moment, but um, it's a great film. Um, and he basically he went to he from that book he went to a tribe and he ask them to say which if somebody left a rotting animal on your doorstep what face would you pull and they would point to a picture and he found this very tight correlation with these six faces in all these different cultures uh, japan america germany the middle of nowhere in papua new guinea um and it seemed very strong very very good science very well done there you go there's, that's the end of that um and he did some further research as to why it is that we don't think that and he, he filmed a cinema in which he put some of the most revolting surgery um, films ever shot. Terrible. And he would put an American student in there and a Japanese student in there. And he found when somebody was in the room, the American student would go, oh, that's gross. Uh, and the Japanese student would sit stoically. In. But when there was nobody in there, they both react the same way. So his theory was, you're taught to repress. Um, and it's all very good. The problem is there are a few issues with the facial expression experiments. The biggest one being none of these people are really that remote. None of them are, are completely different, are unaware of Western films, Western expressions, anything like that. Um, the other one is a lot of the faces in the photographs are really, really exaggerated. So a disgust face wouldn't just be something slightly revolted. It'd be yeah, a really ex over the top disgust face. Um, and the other one is that the translations and the questions were a little bit loaded, a little bit, you're pushing them towards that picture or that picture. And so what happened in the nineties, which has led to Lisa Feldman Barry is one of her colleagues, uh, Russell, um, did the same thing. But what they did is they got a load of different faces, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of faces and said, categorize them into feelings for me. And so the different people from different cultures, different tribes would take these and create piles of different faces and they didn't match. None of them sorted them the same way. And so that was the first, oh, hang on a minute. This might not be quite as cut and dry as we thought. They might not be as universal as we believed. <clears throat> and it's now the point where a lot of research has been done to show that Faces aren't as universal as we thought. Um, and if you make the test more robust, the more robust the test, the more they're not as universal as we thought. Um, so now we're at the situation where people are looking for, why do we think they're universal? <clears throat> and 
Um, the other side of the debate comes from um, the idea that we developed a, that cultures each develop their own set of emotions. And this comes back to the idea of there are untranslatable emotions out there. Um, every day on my Twitter, I have an untranslatable emotion of the day just to bamboozle people because I think it's fun. And um, there are lots of strange emotions out there that once you explain them, they're not so strange. You know, there's uh, the Heige, which is a, I think it's a Norwegian uh, longing for um, a past that never really existed. Um, I can't think where that might be relevant at the moment, but um, the longing for a past that never existed. And there's, Every language has hundreds and thousands of these emotions that are very hard to explain, but that to them it's just a feeling. And so they think that emotions are all culturally constructed, that we cultures, we create our feelings uh, from, like, say, a blank slate. Um, stepping into this is Lisa, Lisa Feldman Barrett, who said, well, what probably happens is there is a core affect we evolved, a basic feeling a disturbance back to the greeks a disturbance a perturbation in the in the body and the mind caused by a change of some kind of sort there we are going nicely happily along and then something happens and the body reacts to it so the body feels this thing and then we work out what it is and that can involve our culture and how we've been raised and what we're supposed to feel and what situation we're in and what we're doing, and what we were doing last time we felt like that, what we're doing the last 20 times we felt like that, and whether anybody else is feeling it, and all these things. And we construct that. Um, and so there is a sort of basic feeling that is universal, but the labels we put on them, fear, happiness, sadness, disgust, so on, they are cultural. There are cultures that would label them differently. Um, and one way they start looking at them is just having two, a graph with two lines, one with just valence, the other which is intensity. And so you say, how strong do you feel this thing and how good or bad does it feel? And then you put a dot and then you ask people in that language, OK, so what would you call that? And we see if it matches translation into another language. And it very rarely does, funnily enough. They'll put, I'm feeling fearful and it's that. And they'll use their words and you say, what's the translation of that word? And they'll say, well, it's being feeling perturbed that there's somebody in the room with you. Whereas the English person will say, I'm feeling frightened, I want to run away. Which is not quite the same. Subtle little differences. Um, so yeah, at least it's all about the third way. That yeah, you're both right. There is something universal in this. It's not all. And that's kind of where you fall in, in, in the end of your book. You that's kind of where it. I am. I I Funnily enough, I uh, came across her after I'd come to that conclusion. I was um, working on disgust, and I thought, well, disgust is this great example of there's obviously something evolved because this thing keeps us alive. Without it, species die out. I suspect even insects have something like this. That, oh, I'm not going to eat that because that'll poison me. But I can see all these different... When I just in 200 years in English history, I can see all these different versions of it. Um, abomination that I mentioned earlier, there's one called eschewing, which is sort of um, the way a, a royal feeling of superiority, so you push something away. There's uh, a German, at that time the German Ekel, which was a bit like the feeling you get when you're being tickled. That sort of, uh, you know I mean? um, All these different things. So I was thinking, well, the answer must be both. Surely. <laughs> it can't be one or the other. Why are they arguing? Stop arguing. You're both right. Um, yeah, so let's wrap it up by talking about the future of emotions, where you end your book. Uh, future. The diffusion of Western culture through the internet, films, radio, music, mm. and so on. Uh, you speculate that we may, ironically, end up with a common set of emotions simply because it's sort of forced on everybody because we're all the same culture at some point. Yeah, we could do. Um, I look at emojis in particular. They used to be. Emojis and emoticons. They used to be Japanese and a Asian emojis and emoticons and Western ones. They were different. Um, in the West, it's all about the mouth. It's, this, it's the bit below the nose to the chin. That's where our emotions mostly happen. And we see smiles. And, and so emoticons uh, would be smiles and lines and upside down smiles and so on. Whereas the, the uh, Asian ones, and particularly the Japanese ones, it'd be the eyes. Uh, wide eyes, tall eyes, round eyes, big eyes, small eyes. And the mouth would often be the same. To express their emotions. 
which on a side note is, I think, why they take to masks so much easier than we do, because they can still express themselves easily and we find it difficult to read people's emotions because they're covered up. So um, that's my little hypothesis anyway. Um, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So what's happening now is the West are kind of dominating the internet. And so Japan, who of course quite likes Western culture in general, are starting to adopt Western ways of expressing emotions through emoticons and other things. And it's getting a lot more homogenized, a lot more, a lot more similar. And I envisage a time when through the internet, we do have a universal set of emotions because we have the universal platform that we're all using the internet. Um, and in order to express emotions to each other between Tokyo and San Francisco, you need to express them in the same way. So after a while, that settles, and we all have the same emotions, or most of us. <clears throat> so yeah, that's kind of where I see the future. I'd like to look at the future a lot more. That's my next journey, I think. What's the future of emotions with AI and robots and emoticons? And, and you're not that confident media. That, that, that we'll ever get to the point where with AI... We know that we've created emotions in a in a, a robot or a computer. I, what is your sense of that? I think my sense is that we might, but we won't know when it's happened. We'll still switch it off. Um, um, one of my favorite examples of that is will always be Blade Runner because they get it absolutely right that a machine you could detect it's a machine until it's developed something that looks like emotions, and then you would lose it. You wouldn't be able to detect it anymore, which of course is the whole plot of Blade Runner. They've got to kill these things before they develop real emotions because then the machine won't work that reads them. Um, and I could see that being, if, if it does happen, that's what will happen. It will be, uh, right, so these machines will reach a point where we can't tell whether they're machines or not. We don't know whether they actually internally feel. So we have a choice. Do we limit their lifespan so they never live that long? Or... Do we just accept our robot overlords? <laughs> which do which do we do? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a trick one. It's something that, I, like I say, it's my next. If I go anywhere, I will start. There's a lot of people out there I'd like to talk to who are working in effective computing. We're all very confident, and certain that they're going to get real feeling robots soon. And I'm, is that a good idea? I'm just asking. <laughs> yeah, and that uh, final Jeopardy. Uh, episode uh, after the final Jeopardy answer where Watson won, Ken Jennings wrote in his little, the answer was, I for one look forward to working with our robot overlords or something like that. It was really funny. Yeah. It's like <laughs> I can see they, they've won. I'm looking forward to working with yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, they'll well, be better that, than us. And if they get angry with us, then hey, as long as they're yeah. nice to us, we can be their <laughs> right, pets. That's right. <laughs> right. Yes. And don't exterminate us. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess the argument is not that they would want to because they don't want anything, but that, that the, what, what is it called? The misalignment problem between goals. Uh, they won't even know that yeah. they're, well, the paperclip example. They won't even know that they're turning everything into paperclips is a bad thing. They're just programmed to do that. I don't know. To me, yeah. this is being played out a little too Hollywood-ish as if we won't have time yeah. to pull the plug or just reprogram it or example I use is like, uh, you know, if, he, if one of Elon Musk Tesla's decides to, uh, that the quickest route to LAX is, you know, up on the sidewalk, plowing through pedestrians to, you know, to get around this crash, uh, uh traffic problem. Well, how long would it be before the regulators stepped into Tesla and said, you're yeah. not putting out any more cars until you yeah. solve this problem? That's why I think if uh, if a robot got to the point where it could develop emotions and that would be dangerous, we would do what happens in Blade Runner and put a lifespan on them and say, <laughs> right after that point, no, uh, <coughs> you're done. The regulations will <laughs> come along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never yeah. underestimate the power of the regulatory state. They they they, they do a lot. No. <laughs> 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 All right, this was fabulous. I'm very happy and feel very good and warm about you and your book. <laughs> How's that? How's that for a positive Thank emotional you. ending? <laughs> What's next That's on your <laughs> research and writing uh, plate? I'm, I've got a few papers. I've actually got lots of papers that I am releasing over the next year. Academic ones. Don't worry about those. They're in academic language. I really don't like writing in academic language, but you've got to do it. It's what you do. 
So there are various forms of the opposite of desire that existed. So I've mentioned some of them, abomination and eschewing, and I've, do, I've done one on horror, and I've done one on um, basically aversion and the early idea of disgust. So they'll be coming out in the next two years. Watch your uh, JSTOR here um, <laughs> as they appear. But um, I think um, my next research is into the future. I'm going to go forwards in time and see what we'll be feeling in 100 years. Oh, good. I like that. If it's not just panic because like everything's that. underwater. <laughs> yeah, actually, but but let me ask you real quick. What is the appeal of horror movies? You know, this like I can't bear to see this, but I can't not watch it. Yeah, it's it's this strange release of uh, it's um a lot of people put it down to um and it's oxytocin, but it's not oxytocin. Um dopamine, the idea that you've survived it. This horrible thing's happened, you survived it, and you don't actually have to be in harm's way. It's like a roller coaster, isn't it? Same thing. You do the, the, the roller coaster at the end you feel brilliant because you survived what you're daft brain thinks was an attack and it wasn't really it's just it doesn't know any better um i think that's a lot to do with horror movies um there's also a fashion when it comes to gory movies we're just the, the weirdest thing about disgust is we're fascinated by it we can't look away we like jokes about filth and poo and all that kind of stuff um and the gorier the better i guess um we just oh we're drawn to it, which is which is a big question. Why are we drawn to the revolting? I don't think anybody really knows yet. We just seem to be and have been for oh, Rabelais wrote about wiping your backside with a swan's neck in the 14th century, you know, as a joke. So yeah, it's, it's actually quite quite a passage. I would read it out, but I don't have it with me here uh, about how that's the best way to cleanse yourself. Um, but we've always been seen, fascinated uh, with that kind of weird. Have you stuff. seen Penn and Teller's film, The Aristocrats? I haven't actually. Yeah, it is, is on my. Well, it's, it's just a series of comedians telling the same joke, but it's a gross joke. I mean, it's the most right. disgusting joke. And then, and then the yeah. punchline is the aristocrats. You know, what do you call these people that do these horrible things? The aristocrats. Anyway, that it's. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but uh, but everybody seems to find this really a compelling thing. Or I was thinking of like watching The Exorcist <laughs> and The Ring or any of these horror films. That, you know, that Hollywood has this yeah. down so good. The timing, the music, the suspense, you know, the yeah. door opens. And, you know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in demons. I don't think, you know, the, in the paranormal. Yeah. None of this is real. But when I'm watching that, I just cannot stop getting goosebumps. And my I can feel my blood pressure going up. My heart rate is going, you know, sweaty, you know, whatever. It's like, wow, this is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, the the uh, another area that I really like is the ability of music and visuals to uh, manipulate emotions. Church are brilliant at it. Churches themselves, these wonderful buildings that you walk in, and you could be the die hard, the most die hard hard atheist ever. You could make Christopher Hitchens look like he was a vassal of the Pope, and you could walk into a church and go, "Ooh, I feel a bit weird," because there's, there's something about the way they're built. They're extraordinary buildings. Right. Um, there was something yeah. about the what is it? Ultras not not ultrasound, but um uh the, the the long, super long wave sound waves that you can't hear them, but they vibrate your yeah. organs and your inside of your body in a way that evokes those emotions. And there's something about cathedrals and the organs that are, are played in there that yeah, I don't know if they knew what they what they were doing when they designed them, but it has that effect. Yeah, they they do. I when I was a child, I was a, I sang at uh, the Royal Albert Hall in a choir, and the low B you flat wow. tube got stuck. So I know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> I was a little choir boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that must have been quite the experience, right? So, yeah. So there again, there's even though my cognition tells me these things aren't real, I, you just can't help because uh, it's just. Yep. just triggering those things so anyway yeah. yeah all right richard good conversation thank you so much right. for your work super interesting and very important really because the, 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 the subtitle thank of your book is something about how it changed the world yes it makes the world this is what drives people to do things is our emotions our passions yeah yeah all right thank you sir all right thank you